Dr. Graham Music, welcome to Shrink Wrap Radio. Thank you very much. I'm really, really pleased to be here and excited to talk to you. Well, I'm really glad to have you on the show. Um, you know, you came or come highly recommended uh, for an interview as a guest by Professor Brett Carr, who's been uh, kind of a regular on the show. And he's been a frequent guest here, and he's always been very lavish in his praise. And to use your metaphor, he really sparks me. As a matter of fact, I think of him as a master sparker, if there is such a thing. <laughs> Maybe we should start a course on master sparking, yeah. And, and you know, uh, one of the ways that he sparked me over the years is by telling me that I have fans at the Tavistock Clinic. And uh, I've been aware of Tavistock, you know, since my graduate school days in, in a fairly psychoanalytic program. And... Um, so sometimes I thought, well, he's just pumping me up, you know, talking about this. But I understand that, in fact, you've been a fan of the show. I've been listening on and off for many years. And what I really love is the mixture, really, of both having a psychoanalytic understanding, but a range of different therapies. And I know your background was also humanistic and from the 1970s, etc. So yeah. I really like that mixture of neurobiology, attachment, psychoanalysis, and the, and the range. Me too. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad it connects because that's, uh, you know, that's kind of what I set out to do. Uh, so we're going to be discussing your book, ReSpark, Igniting mm -hmm. Hope and Joy After Trauma and Depression. Mm -hmm. And uh, I really resonated with the opening statement in your book that you were triggered to write this by the pandemic. And um, and I really resonated with that because uh, I know the pandemic has had, had an impact on my own life. The, the, the sequestration has re really had an impact on, on me. And it's something that I've invited my, in recent interviews. I've invited most of my guests to comment on the pandemic and, and what their reflections are about how it's affected us and and you know, what it means. So uh, I've right away uh, connected with your book on that basis. I, I got excited about that to see that. And um, one of the Would others. Would you like to say, go, on. go ahead. Would you like to say a bit about that? Uh, sure. I, I um, suspect you will anyway, but yes, let's do that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so yes, I absolutely agree. I think the pandemic has had a profound effect on all of us. And one of the things it's done is it's given rise to a kind of closing down, shutting in, uh, a dampening down. Yeah. And that's an area which I've been really interested in over many years in terms of our clinical work anyway, the ways in which I think we spend a lot of time concentrating on people who are very activated, maybe violent, maybe borderline, those kinds of things. But there's a group of people I've worked with over the years that I've really puzzled about who are more shut down and dampened down. And I think that comes from a lack of social connection, good social connection and ease in social connection. And so the pandemic obviously has really, really exacerbated that problem for many people. Yeah, and I I've, I've found it myself, because um, one of the things you comment on is a sort of, dampen down uh, to reach out to other people, to even want to connect with other people. And uh, I've noticed that in myself, you know, that that part of my life, I just, uh, it seems like it was something from the past. So uh, it's good to, to be aware that it's part of a larger process. It's not just me. I don't need to uh, blame myself for that, but just kind of, except that that's, that's something that unfortunately has come to pass. Um, one of the things I love about your book is that you share quite a bit about yourself, about your early years, uh, your past, and at the same time, you're integrating all of that with a, the scientific picture. And so maybe we can start a bit with, your, with a bit of your autobiography. And, 
and you can uh, tell us a bit about uh, your growing up years and the impact that's had on uh, on your career and, and your own journey. Okay, well, I'll try and I'll think about how much to say, of course, as any therapist would, but I was a very shy, anxious little boy. In fact, I couldn't say boo to a goose. There's no way I could have spoken in public when I was a kid. Yeah. And I was also sent off to boarding school when I was very young. And I found myself very timid, very inhibited, very anxious, and not really noticed, in fact. And so because I wasn't causing trouble or making a problem, I think I was left to my own devices a bit too much. And inside, I was feeling not very alive, I think. I was feeling sort of deadened. So one of my coping strategies always was to contract, to shut down. So one of the things I've learned over the years in relation to working with, for example, very deprived people, for example, I worked off for a long time with people who were, one of the classic examples, people adopted from those very depriving Romanian orphanages mm, yes. those years ago, was that there's something very, very dulled about them. And I think that I had something of that about me when I was young, which has given me a kind of empathy for people who are very closed in and shut down and who need a more active reaching out to than some other people that we work with. Yeah, and it's interesting that your work, that you really became a child therapist, I think, is, has been your, your focus and your specialty. And uh, I imagine that comes from a sort of a wanting to reach out to people maybe who had a similar experience to your own. Yes, I, I found I understood them, I suppose. I, mean, I, I trained first as an adult psychotherapist, and I trained as an integrative humanistic type of adult psychotherapist with a bit of a focus on the body yeah. and then I went to the Tavistock and trained as a child psychotherapist where we work much more psychoanalytically and actually for a long time I was a bit embarrassed about my humanistic past in the Tavistock right <laughs> and in recent years I've dared to, you know I've managed to integrate those things into a model which I feel really comfortable with which is very body aware very present a bit more active but also with that psychoanalytic that psychoanalytic insight as well, I hope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've come, you know, I've come to, at first I sort of rebelled against the uh, psychoanalytic perspective that was more or less, I felt forced down my throat in graduate school. Uh, but as time has gone on, I, I have come to value the, the depth of insight that has developed both originally and over the years in that approach. And it's been interesting to me to see other therapists who are trained in some other tradition kind of come around to feeling like, well, I feel like I need to go deeper. I need to have a deeper understanding. And, uh, and they end up when, in one way or another uh, getting that from, from that uh, psychoanalytic source. Mm -hmm. So one of the great things about your book that makes it so humanistically approachable, if you will, is your use of metaphors that are very relatable. And of course, the dominant metaphor in the book is the idea of sparking. Uh, so help us dig into your idea of, uh, of being sparked and unsparked of, of that metaphor, which by the way, really speaks to me. Great, thank you, really please it does. I found it just very, very helpful. It made a lot of sense for me of a range of different things. So, for example, what we want in life is to have sufficient, easy flowing energy. And all of life, in a way, depends on energy. If we don't have energy, we die. Yeah. But some people have too little and some people have too much. And I've tried in the book to try to think about different forms of low energy, especially. So I think about a group of people who I think about as unsparked. In other words, they've never come to life. This uh -huh. might be the highly, highly neglected people who I've described, I hinted at before, for example, some of these orphans who are very shut down. Something about their whole being, their whole bodies, they have a pallor often, they have very little vibrancy in their bodies, in their movement, even their skin tone, their voice lacks, 
prosody and energy and rhythm. And there's something which has never quite come alive in them. And so it, part of our job, I think, as therapists, and basically as human beings in, 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 in their presence, is to try to find some way, some hint of spark, a bit like a little spark that you can flame back into, you know, fan back into life right. again and yeah. grow that potential. So these are people in a way who've never had what you need. So I would think about them as um, it's not that they've had, it's not that they suffer terrible, terrible traumas. It's not the bad things really that have happened to them. It's the good things, the ordinary human warmth, energy enhancing things that mm-hmm. they haven't received which has meant that parts of their personality have just never really come alive. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so they need a bellows of some sort to, uh, exactly. to get exactly. some they, air they, going and to, to, to bring the, the fire to life, the spark to life. Yeah. And what I would say about people like that is that there's something, when you're in the presence of people like that, it's very easy to feel quite flat and dead ourselves. And yeah. so... I would think about that in terms of an embodied counter-transference. So when I'm working with people who are very shut down, I myself can feel shut down. I can feel a bit bored. I might, even if I'm able to admit it to myself and other people, I might even find myself, my mind wandering, those sorts of things. Because yeah. there's a lack of aliveness in them. It doesn't evoke aliveness in us. So somehow we have to bear their lack of aliveness in ourselves, know that feeling deeply, and then be able to reach out to them and find those little sparks of life. Because if we, what you don't want is two dead people in the room, two deadened people, damp down people, but also you don't want to pretend, you don't want to be pretending in therapy. You have to be genuine. And so we have to reach out to them from a place in which we can genuinely spot a bit of aliveness, but know their deadness and and find some kind of contact from that. Right, right. Now you talk about unsparking and de-sparking. What's the difference between the two? Okay, so I mean, these are big topics. There's several chapters on each topic, but yeah. I would suggest that desparking comes from an external danger. And okay. so, it, if I, for example, so I, I think about this mostly with people, adults or children, and I use examples of both in the book, who have, for example, suffered a, a trauma. And so, if there's violent assaults especially if it's developmental trauma that's been ongoing then often you will see a giving up and a shutting down what we often think about in terms of dissociative type of symptoms and there'll be a numbing process yes both in the body but also in the mind so you might see a process some people think about it as a kind of stupefaction a kind of lack of thought but also a a shutting down and we of course all know what a brilliant survival strategy numbing down flopping going still is in as a temporary temporary response to extreme life-threatening danger the trouble is that if you've had too much and many of us as therapists work a lot with people who have had ongoing developmental trauma yes and so they remain shut down and i would see that as de-sparked if you like okay and a big difference between that group as opposed to i would say the unsparked to the ones who've never had the good experiences mm-hmm. like the remaining orphans for example the d- one big difference between the two is the despark people have gone into dissociated states we have to be really really careful about try put about re-sparking them too quickly because what they need more than anything is to feel safe in their beings and in their bodies because the, in a way the whole point of shutting down and dissociating is to not feel because feeling is overwhelming for yeah. them. Yeah. So, so the danger is not re-traumatizing, but finding a way of allowing them to feel safe first. I use the concept of safening. Um, I, I prefer safeness to safety, interestingly, because I think safety is safety from something, whereas safe feeling, f- feeling um, so safening and feeling safe is a kind of sense of ease in yourself, in your being. And many of these people have never experienced that. And so we, in a way, have to give them that experience. It's what Winnicott described as, he called it going on being, that Mm. you have an experience of ease of yourself in the world when you know that there's, there's people you can rely on, you feel securely attached, those sorts of things. And what I find is that people who are, um, 
de-sparked into dissociative states, they, the first thing is human emotional connection. Again, linking back with what we were saying about COVID, there has to be safe connection, which gives signals that, that your nervous system can relax yeah. and feel more ease. I've just been uh, reviewing uh, an interview, a couple of interviews that I did with uh, uh, Stephen Stephen Porges, uh, yeah. who talks very much about safety, and then uh, uh, Deb Dana, uh, kind of uh, an associate of his, who also talked about safety. So all of that really resonates with me, and the uh, and the the psychoanalytic and Jungian notion of of a container. A safe container seems to also come into play here. Um, so, yeah, yeah. what I would say about that is I absolutely yeah. agree. And I think Stephen Porges has done such important work in helping us see the importance of safeness. And yeah. I would say safeness rather than safety, because yeah. safeness is that kind of internal sense of you need safety from danger, and then you need an internal sense of safeness, which comes from yeah. trust in the world, which comes from good emotional experiences. What I would say, interestingly, is that I think that some of the more recent trauma thinking that's been influenced by Stephen Porges has been a bit fearful of daring to process the trauma after the safeness is achieved. So safety isn't the whole story. It's a, it's a, sta it's a staging post on the way to processing trauma. So you can't go to the processing too quickly if you leave that out, then people aren't good. They, people don't really get well. They don't really heal from the trauma. Yeah, yeah. I, I appreciate what you're saying about safeness. And by the way, let me encourage you to illustrate these ideas as you have in your book, if you have the impulse of bringing in either one of your own personal experiences or one of the case examples that you give in the book. That would be great. So another thing that you talk about, and this reminded me of, of uh, Porges, is danger signaling. Mm. Um, so, so talk to so us, what's your context on danger signaling? Okay, so in a way the concept, well, let me just turn the light on actually, because it's got a bit, if we're going to be videoed. <laughs> <laughs> um, suddenly got dark. Um, okay. So danger signals, talk about spark, danger signals are, so the concept has been taken from a guy called Robert Navio, who's written a lot about um, danger signaling at a cellular level, at the level of the mitochondria. So what he said, and it's partly why I love the metaphor for in terms of energy and sparking, he says the mitochondria, we always thought of as the powerhouses of our cells, that they take in nutrients, et cetera, and they give us energy and power and strength. Mm -hmm. But what, he, what he's shown us is that when there's danger, the mitochondria also are incredibly sensitive to danger and then they stop producing energy and they signal for the body to, to shut down if mm. you like and so you're it's sort of thing you often see in for example chronic fatigue syndrome or um other other psychophysiological issues and so the message we have to what the work then is in giving people a sense that they can be safe in their bodies and beings so in a way, it's giving a, a message that the nervous system can relax, which I think is what Porges is saying as well. And so, for example, I've made many mistakes over the years by working with patients who, who both child and adult patients, where I thought really interesting trauma processing work was going on. And in fact, what I, was, what I did inadvertently was trigger them back into a, a traumatized place where they would then shut down yes, yeah. or they would start having PTSD symptoms, maybe flashbacks. And I realized that I'd gone too fast, too quickly. And what they really needed was ordinary safeness. And for a child psychotherapist, that's often really boring work. So the interesting work is a play in which you're working through trauma and thinking about difficult things. Mm. But often as a child psychotherapist, you end up in the UK, you end up playing football with a kid or throwing balls to each other. And think, this isn't therapy. I hope nobody sees me doing this, but actually, it's developing a reciprocity, a trust in human relationships, those yeah. sorts of things. And so that, and then in time, what I find time and time again is that then the play develops into something in which the traumatic experiences can be enacted symbolically when the person feels safe enough, but never before, if you like. Yeah. 
You talk about defenses, which of course is a big concept in psychotherapy. Um, does it have a, a, a different flavor in, in your work here? It does, because I think, so one of the great learnings of the last decade or two has been that defenses aren't just to be bashed through, but they need to be respected because they're always developing for really good reasons. Mm -hmm. So for example, if I came from, so I've worked many, many times with children who came from very violent homes, and then they were adopted into very kind, benign, loving homes. Yeah. But their nervous system and their brains do not see a benign, loving, caring person in front of them. They see a scary person. So the, the adopted parent might go move towards them to try to, I don't know, brush their hair. And the, and the, and the young person might flinch and, fl and slap back. So in other words, they are defending against a danger that actually no longer is there. It's very like the cell danger response. The body thinks there's danger and won't relax. The nervous system won't relax. Yeah, and in that in that context, you also talk about unconscious expectations or predictions. So the yes. child is somehow, based on their past experience, they have a and and with children, but especially with adults, I imagine we have unconscious expectations or predictions that something bad is going to happen. And maybe unconscious because that was formed so long ago. Exactly. I think often these things are formed pre-verbally and they are very deep in terms of almost embodied ways of being in the world, which yeah. is the whole prediction error idea. The, the Carl Friston, who's a, one of the most important neuroscientists probably, talks about this idea of prediction errors which I think is very, very useful. So that adopted boy who lashed out when his parent was trying to be kind was making a prediction error. And so we might think of that as a defense, which was there for appropriate reasons, but then how do you help them lower that defense? Right. And that can't happen until first of all, they feel safe. And so the way I think about defenses is, is, that, is that they have to be respected, but not too much. So we have to watch the person's nervous system to signal whether or not this is a defense that can be challenged by a bit of pressure. And often you see that in signs like sighing or tensing muscles or clenched jaws. These are what a form of therapy called ISDDP, which you might know about, talks about in terms of striated muscle, which is kind of more conscious muscle control. If you start talking about trauma and somebody goes into kind of, I don't know, they, they start saying they feel faint or they feel sick or they need to go to the toilet. That normally is a sign that that's overwhelming anxiety. And we need to respect that by moving back and helping them to regulate. So in a way, defenses can either be challenged where it's appropriate, or sometimes we need to step back and help people feel safe enough before their body signals that it's that that actually these defenses can be challenged. Yeah, you kind of have to titrate it, right? To yeah, use exactly. a chemical yeah. <laughs> metaphor. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I, you mentioned IASDP, and uh, and I've been very impressed by that approach and the the some of the kinds of scripts that people have published to to uh, to show how that can be done, it's really it's really been an important contribution. I think. I think so. I've I've um, started using it much much more, and I've got some extra training in it, and we're developing a training in it around the tablets as well. And of course, it was a psychoanalytically it is psychoanalytically informed training, but maybe going back more like the early Freud, where there's more emphasis on powerful emotional states. And of course, it was originally developed by David Mallon, who was at the Tavistock. Yeah. And then Davin Liu in the States took it forward and shifted it and changed it. But it, rather like John Bowlby, David Mallon never really had the reputation he deserved at the Tavistock. And we need to, in a way, give him back his reputation for, for <laughs> developing something which is really quite special. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, you talk about resetting our nervous system. How do we do that? 
<laughs> e- no, easier said than done. You're right. I think that for any of us, and especially as mine often needs resetting like any of us, but what I find is that when people, so there are certain people, and many of these people I write about in Respar, in, Re- in Respar, have a nervous system which actually isn't a kind of danger response, but you don't know it to look at them. So, for example, I'm thinking about what I'm thinking about people who, for example, might have chronic fatigue syndrome, might have had serious childhood trauma, but you look at them and you think they are as calm as anything. They must be really relaxed. It's very hard to see the signals. Mm. And so they don't have enough what ISDDP would describe as striated muscle. So there's flatness, often you see it in the lack of breathing, lack of breathing depth, those sorts of things. And so, but time and time again, I find, actually it's also true of people who are more dysregulated, is that we have to help people to find a way of knowing and reading their own nervous system so that they can see when they're anxious and stressed. Because actually, the capacity for interception, that reading of our own internal body signals is so lacking so often in trauma because quite rightly in trauma, you need to not feel because that's a survival mechanism. Yes. And so begin, So I can't tell you how often I've worked with people who have no idea what's going on inside them. They don't know what the triggers are, which give rise to, could be violence, but it could be turning on the computer to go back to pornography for the 10th time that day or whatever it is, the triggers are, they're unaware of the triggers because they're unaware of the bodily signals. If you think about Damasio's idea that actually emotions are bodily states, we have to find some way of reading those to make them into feeling states. And so a lot for me, I'm very, I watch body states a lot and I watch my own bodily responses to my patients. And then I would try to help them both be aware of them, try to check out what their body might be saying, but also a lot of it needs, a lot of it before that is in helping them regulate. And it's a, it's a peculiar process, almost like osmosis. I find that when people begin to be aware of their own body states, they start doing things for their own body. So I, I find without me telling patients or clients, they often will be doing yoga classes without me knowing it or um, doing mindfulness classes or those sorts of things which are regulating their nervous systems. And I think often it nearly always has to be a psychophysiological approach to oneself. Yes, yes. Um, I also thought of vacations as a good example of the nervous system resetting to be able to go to a really relaxing place and let go of it all. And... uh, <laughs> so uh, the absolutely think, uh, we haven't been having enough of those recently. Yeah. <laughs> With COVID. Yeah. It, uh, another interesting uh term that you use is nervous system whispering. And I think of the horse whisperer, you know, yeah. that wonderful movie. Uh so tell yeah. us uh, tell us about nervous system whispering. Is this something that the that the therapist does or that the Yeah, I think so. Of course, I did steal the whole concept from the horse whisperer because i just think it's a lovely a lovely metaphor yeah and i also think about us as nervous system sensors if you like so in a way i think to when i'm doing therapy well i can allow myself to be a kind of sounding board for the patient's state of being yes. and so and i might notice my heart racing when before they know that they're anxious or i might notice a sense of sadness in myself before they're able to be aware of that sadness. It doesn't always happen, but when it's working well, then I'm a nervous system, I become a nervous system sensor, and then in a way we can whisper to their nervous system. So it might well be, so there's one patient I work with, for example, who who was, I'll give you an example, which I think was in the book, where she was very, or might be, anyway, she was angry with me about holiday break, and I noticed her looking down at her hand. And in the past, I might have made interpretations or something about holiday break, but I just asked her what was going on with her hands. And she told me that when she was angry with her dad, she wanted to sort of fight fight or hit him or something, but he would then smack her on her hands. So her body had this memory from her childhood 
of her hands being hit. And she, and what was fascinating was her hands actually were red as she talked about this. Wow. And so then we could think about, well, what do her hands really want to be doing at this point? And it allowed her to talk about the fact that there was, in a way, unfinished business. This is probably linking to the work of people like Peter Levine. There was unfi unfinished business in her body because she was angry with her father but had never had the chance to express it. Yeah. And so she had, in a way, contracted. So contraction is a part of de-sparking, turning inwards. And so she was sitting on this unexpressed anger and she spent her life like that, very fearful, but actually, and I could see from the kind of liveness of her muscular state that there was a way in which she needed and wanted and was ready to express some of these feelings. So that would be an example. And actually she kept, what was, what was really interesting is when she could express these feelings, her body came alive. She was open. She was, I don't know if you've, um, Amy Cuddy's work on, um, I forgot what it's called now. Um, power poses which had a little was a bit controversial in terms of the evidence but I think there's something about the ways in which postures change as mm -hmm. people spark back into life mm -hmm. and she was a lovely example of a case where um who sparked back into life when she, her body was allowed to express what had been inhibited and de-sparked if you like yeah great example and so she was able to uh feel better about you going on your vacation <laughs> well right? she was able to be to allow herself to feel not good about it and to be yeah. cross yeah and i think that was um the important thing so it's not so the, the point is not to kind of not feel feelings but it's right. to feel feelings properly and authentically in such yeah. way because a bit like winnicott said if you can if your anger can be known and owned and expressed and tolerated so that the other person survives your anger, then that gives you a sense of separateness, which is a tremendous sense of relief. Mm -hmm. As if all the time she had to be scared that her anger was gonna either upset or anger somebody else, or she would lose a parental figure, then she couldn't really ever own this feeling, which actually, now anger, at least aggression, is a lifeblood. So aggression, of course, from Latin means to move towards. And it's a bit like in mindfulness, you know, the healthy, what we know is we move towards experience, we fold it into our experience, we don't defend against it. Yeah. So it's a bit like in healthy, so the work that Richie Davidson did about mindfulness, where he found that the, actually the kids and the adults who were able to open up to experience, they had more activation in their left prefrontal cortex, and they were able to move towards experience rather than move against it and defend against it. So in a way, I think that's what we want. For, for, our, for ourselves and our clients and our loved ones. <laughs> yeah. Uh, don't you feel like there's a wonderful sort of coming together? Uh, because, you know, we keep referring to this theorist and, and this other one. And there's some kind of convergence, I feel, that's happening in the field, such that it's uh, ultimately going to be a lot less divisive and we're going to understand what the uh, critical elements are. I really, really, really hope you're right. And I do absolutely believe it for myself because I'm passionate about integration and, and I, I can't see how you can understand and do the work that we do unless you take a bit, unless you're able to integrate what can be really, really helpful. And I absolutely think that we're possibly on the cusp of a paradigm shift, yeah. which integrates neurobiology, attachment theory, trauma theory, but also some of the deepest aspect of psychonetic thinking. I absolutely completely agree with you. My worry, of course, is that also the world of therapy and analysis is a very tri as tribal almost <laughs> as, as lots of other places in the contemporary world. And so there's a danger of divisiveness and distrust of the other. But if we can keep open then I think there's a real opportunity for a really exciting paradigm shift. And I wish I was 20 or 30 years younger to see it come to fruition because I actually yeah. think it's going to be a really exciting time. Yeah, I do too. I feel like it's happening. And at the same time, um, I do recognize what you're saying that uh, human beings are human beings. <laughs> and, uh, and so we are, uh, uh, <clears throat> We have parts where we move into jealousy, competition, 
pridefulness, all of those things that can kind of uh, mess up that, <laughs> that vision. Yeah, well, we're seeing it in the world at the moment. I mean, it's, these are scary oh, times. And um, yeah, I wrote about this in a book, actually, it was published in 2014 called The Good Life, where we are thinking a lot about, you know, the best and worst in human nature. A lot of it was about altruism. And but actually in stress and danger, we close in and close down. And then we become distrustful of the other. Yes. And it, it, it inhibits our capacity for empathy and openness. And it's part it links with the whole idea of safening, really, that if we can feel safe, if we can help people feel safe, there's more chance that they can open up and embrace the world instead of defending against it and seeing the other as dangerous and a threat. And I really hope that we can move towards more a world in which there's more openness and trust and mutuality. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, me too. And certainly uh, we're at a juncture where that's coming into awareness. Last night, my wife and I were watching a British series. Uh, fortunately, the, the technology has brought us that capability, and yeah. uh, we, we enjoy a lot of British series. And this one was some, I don't remember the name of the person or anything, but a, a gentleman who goes on walking tours in in the UK and um, so he's walking through the area where the preparations for the Dunkirk landing in World War II were going on and uh, talking about the numbers of, of people who were killed, slaughtered in that, in that, you know, and so with what's happening. So I was feeling a lot of pain just thinking about that combined with the pain of what's going on in, in the Ukraine and feeling yeah. like, you know, how can we not learn that? But I don't think it, it's somehow it's not a general us not learning. It seems to be more about the power people who who are able to um, exert uh, uh, control beyond uh, beyond reason. Yeah, but it's painful beyond belief, isn't it? What's happening at the moment? Yes. And yeah, no, absolutely. Yes. And um, so I love a quote that you took from Joan Halifax, just a wonderful quote. It says yeah. so much about people who have, have, she wants people to have strong backs, soft fronts, and wild hearts. Yeah, I That's think, I, I think it's such a helpful metaphor and it, and it does link with what we're talking about and it links with Ukraine as well because I think there's some misconceptions in the world in the way in which things like fight flight and freeze are described for example so um, I think we do need a strong back and sometimes that's almost that's a therapist or a friend or somebody metaphorically putting their hand on your back to make you feel, you know in a way having a backbone is really really important yeah. and many of the people we work with don't have one but also you can have two kind of what Beyond would describe as an exoskeleton, that you need a softening around the front and you also need a bit of wildness in the heart. And I think that, so if you think about, people often put fight and flight together and they couldn't be more different. So if I'm fearful of you and I go into a fear response and then I might flee, that's my nervous system is completely different. So if I'm so what we're seeing, I think, with Zelensky, I mean, history will show is that he's encouraging people to fight. Now, fight doesn't come from fear. It comes from strength and power and the moving towards that I was talking about before, mm. I think. And that's not that's a strong back, but also it's something a bit wild and hopeful in that. Huh. Okay. It's well, just my, my theory anyway. Yeah, yeah. We'll see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you, you talk about the importance of healthy tension. Yes. Say a bit about so, it. Well, again, if we think about some of the people, the, the kinds of cases I described before, where there's a lack of spark, whether, that, whether that's de-sparked or unsparked, people who there's often a kind of floppiness and a sort of deadness and a kind of lack of energy. And so that is a sign of a lack of life and that how do you get that going again yeah, yeah and in trauma work often that's in feeling some righteous indignation and anger about what's happened 
when or in neglect often it's often it's about just just trying to spark little bits so with the kids i was saying that i worked with before from very deprived backgrounds often it might be a little spark of throwing a ball at them and then they'll throw one back at me and or even kids on the spectrum who would often do do very perseverative isolated things like flapping and if you can make that into an interpersonal game instead of somebody flapping in an isolated way and then oh. you make it into a little bit of a joke and yeah. have a bit of fun about yeah. it that gives yeah. rise to spark life and energy which is what you need in, to live any kind of life and i think those people often particularly people who come from very backgrounds of severe neglect they've shut down and their body has gone numb floppy as pe people talk about the flop response in response to danger and the lack of hope hence the soft front and the wild heart and the but that needs but as well the strong back yeah yeah oh i was intrigued someplace i think it's towards the end of the book and i don't remember what the term was but the the idea is a false spark that maybe some people are so intellectualized talk, talk about that okay so yeah so in a way i divide the book apart from the autobiographical bits into in, and these are very loose metaphors de-sparked unsparked but also missparked and so we might think about this as people who we might have thought about as slightly manic for example so for example i so the great donald winnicott wrote about this in his own way many 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 years ago when he described people who he said um, as a way of avoiding not having anybody to rely on as an infant, they retreated into their head. So their mind, he said, their psyche never resided in their soma. So they developed a kind of intellectual defense. So instead of relying on a, a parent, say a mother who could be there and hold them and make them feel safe and they could relax. If that wasn't there, they some people's response is to develop a hyperactive mind that's always thinking, that's always planning ahead, that's watching, thinking. And these people can be very bright, but underneath, we often see terrible grief and pain that's never really been faced. Mm -hmm. So the therapeutic work with those people, in a way, is to kind of slow them down and lower the nervous system, so that in helping them face a sadness and grief that has never really, really been faced. So the, the British Psychoanalytic School of independent psychoanalysts like Winnicott, Harry Guntrip, Michael Barlin, these people talked about the, the importance of something they called regression, which is when you feel safe enough to slow right down and face feelings that, you're, that one is constantly defending against otherwise, sometimes with a very, very fast mind. There can be other forms of defense which are very activated as well, but that's a very classic one, a kind of full, full self. And I call it a kind of um, mind parenting. Some people have called it a mind object, or um, I, I think I call it a mind mother, actually. It's this idea that you're relying on your own mind instead of relying on what you should be relying on if you're lucky, which is a parent who can really pick, pick up and pick you up, contain you, take care of your needs, and allow you to just relax like a baby can just mold into their yeah. mother. Yeah, I like the mind mother option there. <laughs> that really captures it, I think. And it seems to relate to, you know, what we used to talk about, the reliance on the defense of intellectualization. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, Again, another one I know in myself, and I'm sure many of us do. So yeah. <laughs> it made a lot of sense to me. <laughs> Yeah, all of us who went to graduate school, <laughs> had, yeah. you sort of had to develop that to uh, yeah. survive in that particular yeah. environment. Um, so a lot of your work has been on addiction. Maybe you can tell us about that and where addiction fix, fits into this picture. Well, addiction, addictive traits, I think, fit into something similar to what I just described in terms of the mind dependence which is that when people have had very, very difficult early experiences, they have a predisposition to try to manage feelings that can't be managed, like deep grief, pain, rejection, hurt, upset, lack of confidence, 
by moving towards an object which might make them temporarily feel better. So in kids these days, a lot of it might be gaming. There's a horrendous amount of pornography that people are moving towards. Um, there's various forms of other forms of addiction, drugs, alcohol, shopping, maybe. We all, you know, we can have healthy addictions. You know, mine might be going to the gym or doing sports, for example. But there's where, there are ways of holding yourself together, but also hoping that these things might provide a respite or a, or a way of not feeling what you don't want to feel. So, you know, we all do it a little bit. You know, have a really bad long day. I come home and have a glass of wine or an extra piece of cake or chocolate. or So in small ways, we all do it. But, but these are forms of defensive action, which are attempts to solve a problem that they can never solve. And the problem with that problem is that it can then become further, you can then get further drawn into addictive cycles because the contemporary world, of course, hijacks these systems in our brain and body and nervous systems that are designed for, you know, so we're supposed to move towards sex and food and things that reproduce the species that make you feel good. And those, that dopamine, that, that mesolimbic dopaminergic system is what gets hijacked by these addictive processes. And so quite often I see people who, I work a lot at the moment with people who are addicted to pornography, interestingly, it just happens to be the clinic I work in. They need to always have trauma in the background. And what's interesting is they move much more towards that when they're feeling more triggered or upset. And when they're feeling better in themselves, they don't have the same need to move towards their object of addiction. And it's the same brain pathways, whether it's drugs, alcohol, pornography, gaming, shopping, probably, gambling. You know, it's the same bits of the brain and nervous system that are firing up, that's being hijacked by these systems. So... Again, it's the same thing. We need to help them feel safe enough to relax and then bear and be with feelings that have long been buried and defended against. Yeah, you talk about the hijacking, and one of the things that I get upset about is the fact that there are neuroscientists, people who are trained in neuroscience, to understand these mechanisms in the brain and so on, and who design it into products like games and other kinds of products. And that, yeah. to me, is the devil's work. I, I just—I uh... absolutely agree with you. And it's very interesting how many kind of CEOs of big tech companies don't let their children or nieces and nephews use even even smartphones. Oh, wow. and they knew yeah. they know what they're doing. You know, they want to keep us online because that's how they sell advertising. They want—they don't want us to read a long article. You know, so their profit. Um, model is by keeping us online and selling advertising and so and moving between different windows so in a way giving rise to that kind of juddery jumpy vigilant hyper vigilant sort of attention which then we can then take into our relationships and it's amazing how often you might see i don't know a family out for dinner and they're all on their phones yeah and you know, Facebook, for example, had the capacity many, many years ago to have to have something on the app which would allow them to notify people when there were friends in the area. They didn't use it. Why? Because actually that takes them off Facebook. So, right. and, yeah. so I absolutely agree. And I think the CEOs of Apple and people in Google, they know they're firing up this dopaminergic system. And they've used it deliberately. I completely agree with you. Yeah, yeah. Well, who who do you uh, want to read your book? Who is this book for? I think it's a delightful book, but what's the audience that you project in your own mind? I hope, obviously, therapists and counsellors and social workers and people, I think any professional working with these kinds of issues, I, I really hope it speaks to anyone who might have some of these issues themselves or might know somebody who's struggling with these issues. I don't think there's any one of us who sometimes doesn't feel de-sparked, a bit shut down, a bit deadened, and um, or might, need, might feel the need to help somebody in those states. And so for me, I don't know, I wrote it for myself, if I'm honest. I wrote it because I, got, I was passionate and passionately interested in these areas, and I felt it needed saying. 
Yeah. And I expect it's primarily going to be therapists and counsellors and social workers and psychologists who might read it. But I hope it's got a broader take. It's written re- as easily in as easy language as I could write it in order to you know, attract the, the, uh, the average reader as well. Yeah, I hope I hope so. I think I think that uh, it could really uh, help to spark some people or get them moving in a in a in a direction to seek out the kinds of uh, help that you talk about in the book. So I, I love it. I, you know, I've I'm sort of besieged with self help books, uh, <laughs> with uh, publicists and so on, and I'm getting a bit jaded. And mm-hmm. turning people away, and I feel like, oh no, not another one of these. And um, so, your book superficially could be seen as falling into that category, but it's, it really goes beyond it in terms of uh, the solid uh, clinical and scientific foundation that it's based on. Thank you. I really, really hope it is because you know it's got a deep sense of understanding in it of psychoanalytic work at its core it's got neurobiology and attachment theory and trauma theory central to it and even though it's written as simply as i can as it as it could be it i think it's got a good sort of 30 years worth of experience <laughs> in it as well so I'd be, i i really hope it doesn't fit into the self-help category i think it's great if people can read it for that reason but yeah that isn't the primary motivation yeah well, it's been delightful speaking with you, uh, Dr. Graham Music. I want to thank you for being my guest today on Shrink Rap Radio. And I hope you'll keep listening from time to time. <laughs> I will most certainly. I haven't stopped listening and I'll continue listening. And it's been a great privilege to be speaking to you today. Thank you. <laughs>